Howdy, folks. So, hopefully this... Hopefully this time, uh, this recording actually takes. So, today I'm going to give you a very brief overview of some of the early experimental psychologists. I'm not going to go into a ton of detail, but I want to at least give you enough so that you can orient yourself um, and be able to connect the material from this class to what you may have learned in a history of psych class or in the way ancient times of intro. So early experimental psychologists, these 19th century psychologists, scientists were generally interested in identifying the common aspects of people rather than individual variation. They considered uh, differences between individuals to generally be a source of error that rendered any attempt of measuring humans as in a, it, inexact. In other words, the idea here that I'm trying to convey is that they viewed differences between people as a nuisance that needed to be corrected for, and that it was frankly a pain to deal with. Now, this may sound, not the, the pain to deal with, but the looking for similarities piece may remind you of ANOVA, because it should remind you of ANOVA, looking at differences within and between groups. Um, that's, that's where we're going. So, uh, prepare yourselves for the future. But we're not there yet. We're still talking about ancient white dudes from Europe and the United States. So Johann Frederick Herbert was really interested in modeling the mind mathematically. He was the founder of pedagogy as an academic discipline. And a lot of his work went against Kant, who's this big famous philosopher. Other scientists of this time include Ernst Heinrich Weber, who's the first half of the Weber-Fechner law, this idea that the stimulus of a sensation grows as the logarithm of the stimulus's intensity. So Weber was straight in the 18th century, or 19th century. Uh, he's a German physician. He's from Leipzig University, where a lot of the original psychologists, like Wundt is in Germany as well, the German Federation as well. And he studied sensory thresholds. A lot of the early work was kind of sensation and perception based. And he was particularly interested in the just noticeable difference. So next, Ooh, let me pause, edited the scene. Cool. So the other half of the Weber-Fechner law is Gustav Theodor Theodore Fechner, whose name I'm probably butchering. So he was also interested in the mathematics and modeling of humanity, but primarily in sensory thresholds. So he's considered by many the founder of psychophysics, as well as one of the founders of experimental psychology. So again, got the Weber, here's the, the um, Bonnie to Clyde of the Weber Fechner law which related the sensation and stimulus together. This is also a lot of other people consider him to be the founder of psychometrics and measurement because you had to be able to measure these differences in what's the smallest amount you can measure. All right, so Fechner's got a long, long legacy, including Wundt. He, so Fechner was a huge influence on Wundt and Freud and Titchener, you name it. He's influential. So Wilhelm Wundt is one of the founders. He's the first to set up an official psychology lab anywhere. Uh, Cattell gets the credit in the United States. And so we got Wundt. Uh, next, we've also got Fechner, or Titchener. It's different from Fechner. Titchener is has a huge influence on psychology later on frankly every uh, female psychologist from the early 19th or the early 20th century no late late 
19th, early 20th, came out of Titchener's lab. Uh, not all of them, but a lot. And so Titchener brought structuralism, which is this idea of trying to find the, the components of sensation to the United States. And actually his brain is still on display as of the time of this recording at the psychology department at Cornell. There's actually a lot of brains in the psych department at Cornell. I don't know why, but they seem to have accumulated there. So if you ever end up in upstate New York, well, not up upstate, but like in the Ithaca region, go visit the psych department and check out their brains. We got Guy Montrose Whipple next. So he was a student of Kitchener. There's a lot of like X was a student of Y, who was a student of X, who was a student of Wunsch. Psychologists do take pride in their legacy of like how far they can go back. Um, I've got some fun legacy pieces too, but I won't get into those. Uh, so anyway, he was a, study, a student of Kitchener. Uh, he was a pioneer in human ability testing. He conducted seminars, so just classes essentially and talks that changed the field. Well, frankly, that changed how we thought about psychological testing. And his criticisms caused the American Psychological Association to set the first standards for professional psychological testing because of his criticisms. Now I will talk about Louis Leon Thurstone for a little long a little bit longer because he's the granddaddy of factor analysis. And it seemed silly not to. So and he also laid the foundations for intelligence research as well as its link to factor analysis. Like the psychometrics lab at uh, North Car at University of North Carolina is his lab, and it has been a powerhouse for quantitative psychologists. My advisor went there, and I nearly went there, but that's not here nor there. So Thurstone, he um huge contributor. He attended Webble seminars. He uh, started to approach, me his approach to measurement was termed the law of comparative judgment. And I'll talk a little about that later. But just to give you a sense of how much influence he had, he also conceived of intelligence as a measure, like how to measure it. Uh, is he considered intelligence to be composed of primary mental abilities, and so he was one of the first folks to develop and publish a test uh, with separate components. So his tests were designed to measure, uh, so each test was designed to measure a different component rather than try and smush them all together. So you got verbal re verbal meaning, perceptual speed, reasoning, number of, number of facilities, so like your ability to work with them, rote memory, word fluency and spatial relations. So this test, while it wasn't super popular, is foundational both for linking with factor analysis as well as its ability to think of ability as more than just one general factor. And it kind of laid the stage for other theorists and test developers to explore various components of intelligence and ways to measure. This is not the same thing as multiple intelligences. Multiple intelligences is garbage. Utter garbage. Like, oof. I have very strong feelings about that. It's just not, the idea of multiple intelligences is that all your intellectual abilities are uncorrelated. So that you could be like extraordinary in like physical, oh, kinesthetic ability. They, that's not how it works. There's this thing called the positive manifold where people who are high tend to be high on one aspect of cognitive ability also tend to be on average higher in other aspects. There's a positive correlation. And uh, there's empirical basis to back that up. Not much evidence for uh, Howard Gardner's um, 
stuff. But he sells a lot of books, so good for him. All right. So that was my little quick uh, jaunt through early experimental psychologists. I wanted to at least acknowledge that there is a history here. But for this class, I'm going to focus more so on actual constructs that and like early foundations that kind of lay the groundwork. Because other than Thurstone, most of these guys are just interested in their specific content area, and it didn't really change the field of measurement the way the ones I'm going to talk about in a bit are. So that's where we're going. So that's where we went, and I'll see you in the next video. Bye-bye!